Hey everyone, in this lesson we are going to talk about pentose phosphate pathway and before I talk about the pathway I first want to apologize for not uploading videos for a long time but I promise that I will be uploading videos regularly from now onwards. So let's talk about the pentose phosphate pathway. It is also known as hexose monophosphate pathway or 6-phosphogluconate pathway and it operates exclusively in the cytosol. Now pentose phosphate pathway is another means by which cells oxidize glucose. So in glycolysis, glucose is oxidized to generate ATP, NADH and pyruvate. Whereas pentose phosphate pathway branches from glycolysis at the level of glucose 6-phosphate and that's why it is called as hexose monophosphate pathway because glucose 6-phosphate is 6 carbon molecule and also called as hexosis. So in pentose phosphate pathway, the phosphorylated form of glucose that is glucose 6-phosphate is oxidized to generate NADPH and carbon dioxide to synthesize ribulose 5-phosphate. And this is not the end of the pathway. This is only the one part of the pathway or one phase of the pathway. And it is also important to mention that no ATP is directly consumed or produced in the cycle. Now it has three main important functions. First, it provides reducing equivalence in the form of NADPH for reductive biosynthesis synthesis such as fatty acid steroid synthesis. It also deals with the oxidative stress. It provides ribose 5-phosphate for nucleotide and nucleic acid biosynthesis and it produces triosis, hexosis and pentosis where pentoses are necessary for nucleotide synthesis. Now as I mentioned that the pathway occurs in the cytosol in two phases. So the first phase is the irreversible oxidative reaction that led to the formation of ribulose 5-phosphate from glucose 6-phosphate. It. And through the process, it also synthesizes two molecules of NADPH from one molecule of glucose 6-phosphate. And because we have three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate here, that means it will generate six molecules of NADPH. Now NADPH is an excellent donor of high energy electrons which function as a biochemical reductant and this portion of the pathway is particularly important in the liver, memory gland, adipose tissue for fatty acid synthesis and it is also important in steroid synthesis in tissues such as testes, ovaries, placenta and adrenal cortex as well as it is also important in dealing with oxidative stress in erythrocytes. The second phase of the pathway is reversible non-oxidative reactions that permits ribulose 5-phosphate produced by the oxidative portion of the pathway to be converted into ribose 5-phosphate. And this is important because it provides sugar backbone for nucleotide synthesis which is important in rapidly dividing cells. So in short, ribose 5-phosphate is needed for the synthesis of nucleotide to be incorporated into DNA and RNA. Now alternatively, through series of reactions, pathway can also synthesize glycolysis intermediates such as fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now in many cells that carry out reductive biosynthetic reactions have a greater demand for NADPH than for ribose 5-phosphate. In this case, through series of reactions, ribulose 5-phosphate is converted into fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And these glycolytic intermediates are then recycled back to glucose 6-phosphate via gluconeogenesis to generate NADPH through irreversible oxidative reactions. And the cycle goes on until the demand for NADPH is met. Okay, so now that we know about the two phases of pentose phosphate pathway, next we are going to learn in detail about each phase of the pathway. So first, let's talk about irreversible oxidative reactions. So the pathway begins with the oxidation of glucose 6-phosphate and the product of the reaction is 6-phosphogluconolactone. And the reaction is catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme and this enzyme is specific for NADP+, which then reduces NADP plus to NADPH. And this is the first step of the major pathway. The reaction is irreversible and highly regulated. That means the product of the reaction, that is NADPH, is also a potent inhibitor of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. So under most metabolic conditions, the ratio of NADPH to NADP plus is sufficiently high to substantially inhibit the enzyme activity. That means cells already have enough NADPH to carry out reductive biosynthesis. However, with increased demand for NADPH, the ratio of NADPH to NADP plus reduces and in that case, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is activated to synthesize more NADPH. 
Now, six phosphogluconal electron produced in step one is hydrolytically unstable and readily undergoes a spontaneous ring opening reaction to synthesize six phosphogluconate. And the reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called 6 phosphogluconoelectronase. And in the third reaction, the oxidative decarboxylation of the linear product that is 6 phosphogluconate is catalyzed by enzyme 6 phosphogluconate dehydrogenase to synthesize ribulose 5 phosphate, which is a pentose sugar. And, and the reaction also synthesizes carbon dioxide and second molecule of NADPH through NADP. So these three steps are basically the irreversible oxidative reactions of phase one of pentose phosphate pathway. And the goal of this portion of the pathway is to provide reducing equivalent in the form of NADPH for reductive biosynthesis processes. So this is the overview of pentose phosphate pathway and this is the irreversible oxidative reactions where every three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate that enter the pathway yield three ribulose 5-phosphate molecules in stage 1 or phase 1 of pentose phosphate pathway. Now in the next phase, which is the reversible non-oxidative reactions, these three pentoses, that is three ribulose 5-phosphate are converted into one ribose phosphate and two xylulose 5-phosphate. And from here, these three pentoses, such as one ribose 5-phosphate and two xylulose 5-phosphate, are eventually converted into two fructose 6-phosphate and one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Those are glycolytic intermediates. However, the conversion of these three pentoses into glycolytic intermediates involves a remarkable juggling act which is catalyzed by two important enzymes, transketolase and transaldolase. And I say this juggling act because you can clearly see that this looks very complex and which involves these two important enzymes. And that is what we are going to learn in our next phase of reversible non-oxidative reactions. So for reversible non-oxidative reactions, 3-ribulose-5-phosphate must convert into 1-ribose-5-phosphate and 2-xylulose-5-phosphate. Here you can see that ribulose-5-phosphate is isomerized into ribose-5-phosphate with the help of ribulose-5-phosphate isomerase enzyme. And secondly, ribulose-5-phosphate can also be epimerized to form xylulose-5-phosphate uh, with the help of enzyme ribulose-5-phosphate epimerase. Now let's first talk about the reversible non-oxidative reaction which involves the enzyme transketolase. So in the previous slides we learned about how ribulose 5-phosphate is converted into ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate. So now here we have xylulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate. And with the help of transketolase enzyme, xylulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate is converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and sedohepchulose 7-phosphate. So the enzyme transketolase is a thiamine diphosphate dependent enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of a two carbon glycoaldehyde group from a ketose phosphate that is xylulose 5-phosphate to ribose 5-phosphate to generate glyceraldehyde and sedohepchulose 7-phosphate. So basically this two carbon glycoaldehyde group is transferred onto ribose 5-phosphate so this becomes sedohepchulose 7-phosphate and this becomes glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So in short, the ketose phosphate substrate is shortened by two carbon atoms and the aldose phosphate substrate is lengthened by two carbon atoms and subsequently they become glyceraldehyde and sedohepchulose 7-phosphate. So here you can see that ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate are converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and sedohepchulose 7-phosphate with the help of transketolase enzyme. So the second reversible non-oxidative reaction is carried out by transaldolase enzyme. So this is the portion of the reaction we are going to talk about now. So here we have sedohepchulose 7-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate which was obtained from the previous reaction. And the enzyme transaldolase that catalyzes the transfer of a 3-carbon dihydroxy acetone group from a ketose phosphate that is sedohepchulose 7-phosphate to an aldose phosphate that is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and converts them into erythrose 4-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. And the third reversible non-oxidative reactions involves again transketolase enzyme. So for this reaction, we have xylulose 5-phosphate and this is the second xylulose 5-phosphate which, which was obtained from ribulose 5-phosphate. And we also have erythrose phosphate which was synthesized from the previous reaction. So both xylulose 5-phosphate and erythrose phosphate with the help of transketolase enzyme 
they are converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. And again, transketolase enzyme catalyzes the transfer of true carbon glycoaldehyde group from xylulose 5-phosphate to erythrose 4-phosphate and eventually converting them into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. So this is the overview of reversible non-oxidative reactions of pentose phosphate pathway. So we started with 3-ribulose 5-phosphate, which were three pentoses. They were then converted uh, into 1-ribose 5-phosphate and 2-xylulose 5-phosphate. So these are the reactions. So we started with two pentoses, that is ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose 5-phosphate, and they were converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and sedohepchulose 7-phosphate. Now this Cetohepchulose 7-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are then converted with the help of transaldolase enzyme into fructose 6-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate. And then the next pentoses or the second xylulose phosphate which was derived from ribulose 5-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate are then converted into fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So in total we started with three pentoses and we ended up with two 6-carbon molecules that is fructose 6-phosphate and one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So these are the glycolytic intermediates. Now in the next slide, I want to talk about what happens to these glycolytic intermediates we have generated through this pentose phosphate pathway. So I'm again going to start with our first phase of pentose phosphate pathway that is irreversible oxidative reactions. So if the need for NADPH is higher, this phase of the pathway is activated where glucose 6-phosphate is converted into ribulose 5-phosphate to generate NADPH. And that is important for reductive biosynthesis processes such as fatty acid synthesis, steroid synthesis. Now, if the demand for nucleotide synthesis is high, then NADPH, such as in rapidly dividing cells, then ribulose 5-phosphate is converted into ribose 5-phosphate. And ribose 5-phosphate then can be used to synthesize nucleotides. Now, if the demand for NADPH is higher than nucleotide synthesis or ribose 5-phosphate, then ribulose 5-phosphate is converted into xylulose 5-phosphate. So from here, you know that with the help of transketolase enzyme, ribose 5-phosphate and xylulose are converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and cetohepchulose 7-phosphate. And these two, with the help of transaldolase enzyme, are then converted into fructose 6-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate. And erythrose 4-phosphate, along with xylulose 5-phosphate, are converted into fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate with the help of transketolase enzyme. So here, in this pathway, now we have two fructose 6-phosphate and one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which are the glycolytic intermediates. And this is also the second phase of the pentose phosphate pathway that is reversible non-oxidative reactions. And like I said, if the demand for NADPH is higher than nucleotide synthesis, that also means that we need constant production or constant synthesis of NADPH. And if the pentose phosphate pathway stops here, then cells cannot generate NADPH anymore and that will inhibit the reductive biosynthesis processes. So in order to synthesize more NADPH, this glycolytic intermediate such as fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are then channeled back into glycolysis pathway and through gluconeogenesis pathway they are eventually converted into glucose 6-phosphate and that way they can re-enter into pentose phosphate pathway to synthesize more NADPH through reversible oxidative reaction phase. So this is basically the overview of two phases of pentose phosphate pathway. Now in the next slide, I want to talk about the modulation of oxidative and non-oxidative phases depending on the cellular requirement. Now the first scenario is in case of demand for NADPH and this demand could be mild or moderate. So in that case, the starting material would be just one molecule of glucose 6-phosphate and two molecules of N NADP plus water and then that will lead to the synthesis of one ribulose 5-phosphate, carbon dioxide and two NADPH molecules. So one glucose 6-phosphate molecule synthesizes two molecules of NADPH. Now in the second scenario where the demand for nucleotide synthesis is higher than NADPH. Now in that case we are going to take the reaction a little bit further because we start we are going to start with one molecule of glucose 6-phosphate and we have two molecules of NADP plus and water and that will lead to the synthesis of ribose 5-phosphate, one ribose 5-phosphate, carbon dioxide and two molecules of NADPH. So, so here you can see that we started with one molecule of glucose 6-phosphate and we ended up 
having one molecule of ribose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate then can eventually be used for nucleotide synthesis. Now, if the demand is really high, then since the second phase of the reaction, which is also the reversible non-oxidative reaction, it is possible to synthesize ribose 5-phosphate from fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate because all these reactions are reversible. So that means they can regenerate ribose 5-phosphate from reversible non-oxidative phase and then this ribose 5-phosphate can be used for nucleotide synthesis. Now the third scenario is if the demand for NADPH is greater than nucleotide synthesis. Now if the demand is too high, then we are going to start with three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate. So our starting material is more. Instead of one glucose 6-phosphate, now we have three glucose 6-phosphate. We have six NADP+, plus, three molecules of water, which is then going to synthesize two molecules of fructose 6-phosphate and one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Also synthesizes six molecules of NADPH, uh, three carbon and water. So here you can see that this is the, and this balance equation is the overall pentose phosphate pathway equation. So we started with three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate and we ended up having two molecules of fructose 6-phosphate and one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So as I mentioned earlier, these are the glycolytic intermediates. So through gluconeogenesis pathway, they can be converted back into glucose 6-phosphate. And that way they can re-enter into pentose phosphate pathway to synthesize NADPH through irreversible oxidative reaction. Now NADPH is very important. As I mentioned, it is the reductive bioequivalent. So it is used in lactating memory gland and adipose tissue for fatty acid synthesis. And it's really interesting to know that around 14 to 16 NADPH molecules are used for every fatty acid such as palmitate. Now it is also important in lung and liver for reductive biosynthesis. And it is also important in steroid synthesis such as in testes, ovaries, placenta and adrenal cortex and as well as in white blood cells to kill bacteria and also to reduce oxidative stress in response to invading bacteria. So this is pretty much for pentose phosphate pathway and this is just another way of showing overview of pentose phosphate pathway. So I really hope that you learn something new from this lesson and if you do so please like and share the video and subscribe the channel. I will see you soon in my another video and thanks so much for watching again and have a great day.